Looking in the sky, I may not know the moment, and I may not know the day, but I know that I believe in when it calls his church away. I'm going home with Jesus in the twinkling of an eye. I made my reservation for a mansion in the sky. any time and a crowd of life is waiting thank god it'll soon be mine i got my invitation through a place called calvary through the precious blood of jesus this trip's been paid for me i'm going home with jesus in the twinkling of an eye i'll make my reservation for the mansion in Check, check. Hey Amen. Let's all stand together. Brother Matt, can you turn on the blue mic? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I love you and I give you all the glory. I thank you for tonight. I thank you for letting everybody be here. Lord, I pray for the bus that's coming. Lord, I pray you bring them here safe and sound. And I just love you and I give you all the glory. In your precious and wonderful name I pray. Amen. Sorry, Union, I didn't tell you. Uh, I'll fly away. Some glad morning. When this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's blessed shore. I'll fly away. Oh, I'll fly away. Oh, glory. I'll fly away. When I die.
Anybody got a testimony tonight? How God's been to him this week? Come on. Nobody? Go ahead. Woo! Amen. Anybody else? Go ahead. Amen. Anybody else? Go ahead. Brother this year. Keep him in. I know what I'm talking about. He's a cowboy hat. Big guy. Got one more for you, and it's called uh, There Was Jesus. In a life I tried to make it on my own. Every time I tried to stand and start to and all those lonely roads that I've traveled on, there was Jesus. When this life I built came crashing to the ground, when the friends I had were nowhere to Every 
All right, well... If you take your Bibles with me and turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. <laughs> Second Samuel chapter 11. You know, I want to talk to you this evening about a... Sometimes words are so slight... And yet the slightness of words changes the entire meaning of something. I want to give you a phrase, and then I'll give you another phrase. They seem to be the same, but they're not. They're close. You know, sometimes we get tired. You get tired, I get weary. We get weary. In well-doing, you get weary. As a matter of fact, the more when you try to do things right, it almost seems very rewarding, but very tiring. And sometimes we grow weary. And yet, there's a great difference between growing weary in the work and growing weary of the work. They're totally different. Because i got to tell you, sometimes we get weary in the work, and sometimes, boy, you just got to take a break. Sometimes you got to take a deep breath. Sometimes you just need to sit down for a while. Sometimes you just need to back up a little bit. Emotions start running high. All of a sudden, fatigue sets in, all of the above. Vince Lombardi said fatigue makes uh, cowards of us all. And so all of a sudden fatigue sets in and we start getting tired in the work. Sometimes, listen, some, isn't that like that with family? Sometimes, boy, one kid, uh, the shoes are running out, the other one needs, uh, you know, a dental appointment, then the other one has a fever, and then this and that. And we get tired. Doesn't mean you get tired, you vacate your family, but I got, you, got weary, you get weary in the family. It's different when you get weary of the family. Two different things. So I want you to notice how this works, how it affects us, and how it is we combat it. Three very simple things that line up with it. I want you to notice what the Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Now, in this portion of scripture, I want you to know that David, anybody know how old David is when he becomes king? When David is, is the, I mean, he's been anointed and he has been announced king. He is the king. Any idea? Any guesses? 30. So David turns 30 years old. Chapter 5, verse 4. David turns 30 years old. Now he is chased by Saul for seven years. So the whole time from the time he killed Goliath and he became the national hero and ladies and women began to sing, play their timbrels and say, Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. And envy set in, and all of a sudden he was very upset. And seven years, Saul chased, Dan, uh, chased David. For seven years. And then David sat upon the throne, sat actually for eight years. So 15 years have gone by. And David has gone on. David is a warrior king. There is nobody like David. He has composed many psalms by this time. And David has had many experiences. David has experienced a plethora of God's presence. And he is an individual that is labeled as a man after God's own heart. So David is quite the individual. As a matter of fact, for Christianity, if you were to look up the poster child, David would probably be that person. If you were to look the up poster, the poster child for being God's man on the spot, it would probably be David. I want you to see something with me, as great and grandiose as this may be in the description of David. I want you to read with me 2 Samuel chapter 11. 
The Bible says it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Reba, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. The Bible says at a time when kings go forth to battle. Let me tell you the three, the three steps, the three phases that are active in the life of David. They are active in your life right now. They are active in my life, and they will be active all throughout your life. There's three phases. They're different. They never run simultaneously. One runs right after the other. And you can attach this to anything that is going on in your life, will go on in your life, or the things that you see. Three different things. They're this. What God has done, what God is doing, and what God is getting ready to do. Those three things. You're in one of those phases. In other words, in your life, you can look back and say, wow, look at everything God has done. Or you can be right now saying, boy, God is at work in my life, and God is doing some things in my life. God is doing, God is doing these things. And then it's going to be God is going, going to do something. It hasn't happened yet. You see it coming, but it hasn't come into fruition. So how do I get to the point where weariness begins to set in and I start crossing over from being weary in the work to becoming weary of the work. Becoming weary of the work is very, very dangerous. The reason it's dangerous, I don't know if you guys have ever seen anyone that has had diabetes, serious diabetes, especially get older, you start getting some diabetes, some diabetes. And when you do, a lot of times it starts where? In the toes. You guys have ever seen? All of a sudden the toe gets dark and it gets a little bit darker and all of a sudden the next thing you see is, Okay, are we amputating the toe, the feet, the foot, or below the knee? And that's the conversation that comes. And many of you, if you don't know somebody like that, you probably know somebody like that, or have you heard of somebody like that? What begins to happen is that diabetes soon begins to, it turns dark, it turns to gangrene, and it starts getting in the blood. And if you don't deal with it, the reason they amputate it is if you don't take care of it, it soon starts spreading worse, and now you're in a lot of trouble. So what they do is they amputate. They begin to start cutting it. They begin to start chopping. They hope they got everything. Sometimes they don't. They have to come back and cut some more. You've heard the horror stories. Well, when you start thinking about our lives and start thinking about how things work, it's the same way. Sometimes things come into our lives and all of a sudden amputation begins to occur. We begin to cut ourselves off from different situations, scenarios. But if I start thinking that I am tired of the work, you can translate to everything else because it will spread just like that gangrene. You see, if I get tired, if I get tired of something, I will soon get tired of something else. And then I will get tired of something else because now I realize I can quit. I can stop. I start validating it. So if I get tired of being in church and I validate it, other people have done it, and all of a sudden it's, it's me, I can very easily cross over start saying, I'm so tired of being in my family and my marriage. And what begins to happen is I now have an out to begin to make excuses to get out of things. And the main reason is because I am tired of it. I will not deal with it. Whereas when you're tired in something, you take breaks, you take big breaths. Sometimes you weep through it. Sometimes you'll walk through it. But the thing is, for the long haul, I'm going to stay and I'm going to take care of this. this is, I'm going to see this thing through. So I want you to see King David now. Three things have occurred in his life. Three things are in his, in his life. The things that God has done, the things that God is doing, and the things that God is going to do. You've heard me pray before. God, thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you're doing. But thank you most of all for what you're about to do. Well, we get caught in one of those three cycles. Now, the first one is the one that gets us there, which is what? Whenever it is I start thinking alone on being tired of something or what God has done, I can get stuck there. I can get stuck there. You can get stuck there. Why? Because if what I've done was a victory, what I did was something that really worked out well, and I've been through the struggle, I went through the valley, I went through the fight, I went through the war, I went through the storm, I went through whatever went through, and you look back and it was done. I would rather stay there and keep bragging and keep saying what God did because I surely don't want to go through it again into what he is now doing in my life. It's a lot easier to reminisce on what has happened. And by the way, the older you get, 
personal witness. The older I get, the greater I was. The stories are better, aren't they? Boy, that, that deer I shot, I'm not a hunter, so I'm exact. Fish. The fish I caught was not a, a, a 20 inch you know, trout, it begin, begins to be 27. And then after a while, it's a 31 inch trout. And then it, the older I am, the better I was. And so sometimes we begin to see what was done in our lives. And boy, when we look back, it was, it was great. It was greater. It was wonderful. But what am I going to do about what God is doing now? David had killed a giant. David had become a hero in his nation. Zero to hero. David became a champion. David became all of these things. David became the king of Israel. David was declared so many things, the sweet psalmist of Israel. He became so many different things that the Bible says, David, it's time to go to war. Haven't I been through enough wars? Haven't I been through enough fights? Haven't I proven myself by now? I think I should be able to stay home once because I am tired of it. So therefore, send Joab. Send someone else to take care of. The only problem is, when you send someone else to take care of what God has given you to do, it's not the same thing. There are some things God has called me to do that he hasn't called you to do. There are some things God has called you to do that he hasn't called me to do. And when we stay in our lane and do exactly what God has called us to do, guess what? We diminish and he exalts. We begin to fade and he begins to shine a light for a lot brighter because now it's not about us, it's about him. And so, <laughs> so the Bible says this, now watch this. It says, at a time when kings go forth to battle, David sends Joab and David stays at home. He is stuck on what God has done. He begins to glory in the past and he grows weary of warfare. You ever grow weary of warfare? Boy, have you ever just wrestled with something and fought against something? And boy, you have shed tears, and you have put in yeoman's work, and you have done it. And through it all, man, God blessed you. Through it all, God revealed himself to you. Now, here's the difference. When I am doing those things, and I continually am doing them, but then I grow weary of it, I then start fighting not for God's glory. I start fighting for my own. And all of a sudden, it doesn't matter what God wants. It doesn't matter what God directs. It doesn't matter what God instructs. What begins to matter is me. I don't like that. Yeah, but the Bible says, I get what the Bible says, but have you been going through this all this time? Have you been wrestling and struggling with this? Have you been the one that's been placed and have you been the one that's been humiliated? And all of a sudden, it's no longer about God and what God is teaching me. It is now about me. And it's like God has taught me everything he's going to teach me. I don't need to learn anymore. I get to that point. I am about to grow weary of the work. I am about to grow weary of what God has intended for me to do. And I'm no longer weary in it. I am weary of it. And as soon as that happens, it's like dominoes. It starts to affect everything. And the principal person in everything is me. You have no idea what I've been through. You have no idea what I, I, I am going through. You have no idea all the struggles. You have no idea. David, I'm pretty sure, looked and he says, Saul chased me for seven stinking years. I didn't do nothing wrong to him. For seven years he chased me. And all I did was try to love him. All I did was try to serve him. All I... What David forgets is during those seven years, God built a mighty group of men around him through the grace and knowledge of God. Through those seven years, David learned to trust God like no one else. During those seven years, some of the greatest psalms that you will read from 42 all the way down to 76, when you read all of those, it's when Saul is chasing him. You know what the greatest chapter in your life is? It's when Saul was chasing you. You know what the greatest chapter in your life is of the evidence and the demonstration of God? It was when Saul was trying to kill you. Because when all the victories came and all the things were done, it was only for a moment. It was just for a second. Have you ever noticed that whenever you have great victories in life, it took so long to get there and all of a sudden it's like, it's gone. It's like the ticker tape parade. Boy, this is great, it's wonderful. 30 minutes later, it's over. The blessing wasn't the ticker tape parade. The blessing was getting there. The blessing was you moving from here to there. So David begins to glory in his past. Now watch the sequence. 
When David begins to glory in his past, and he's sitting on the throne, I look pretty good in, this, in these crown jewels. This robe feels pretty nice. Sure isn't the shepherd's garment I had when Saul was chasing me. Boy, this food tastes pretty good instead of receiving what Abigail gave us. Boy, all of a sudden, the people all around me are bowing and prostrating instead of them spitting and chasing and trying to kill me. All of a sudden, it's like, if I go into another battle, another war, I become David of old, and I kind of like David that's new. And so the Bible says he stays home. Now look at this. The Bible says in verse 2, it says, And it came to pass in an evening time that David arose from off of his bed, walked upon the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. The woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am a child. Now, let me show you the progression. Sin will always take you farther than you want to go. It will always keep you longer than you want it to stay. And it will cost you more than you ever want it to pay. David is on top of the world. David is God's man. David is being blessed. So the very first thing I want to bring your attention to is this. The greatest attacks in your life will not come in the valley. They will come at time of victory. The greatest attacks and temptations to stray away from God will not come when you're in warfare. You know why? Because when I am in warfare, I am too busy crying out to God for help. When I am in a valley, I am too busy seeking and searching for God to help me. When I am up to here in trouble, I am too busy trying to do the right thing because I want God to deliver me. But when everything is good and everything is paid for and everything is victorious and I am now reaping what has been sowed and I am now being blessed, if I don't continue in the battle, the battle now comes to me. And when it comes to me, It'll never come from where you expect it. So the Bible says David is walking around. He's on sabbatical. He's taking a break. He's on vacay. <laughs> he's using his PTO. And so he's around there and he's like, now here's the funny thing. It's a beautiful thing that David is strolling. But as, as uh, Rafiki told Simba, let's look I want you to notice what the Bible says. <laughs> it came to pass in an evening that David arose from off his bed. What is the first thing you see there? What, what in the world is David doing sleeping all afternoon? He's waking up from his nap. Not about to go to bed. What is the, remember the old saying, those of you old timers like me, what is the devil's workshop? An idle mind is the devil's workshop. Let that mind just sit there and do nothing. Let that mind be carried off by television or carried off by computer things. Let the mind, uh, what is it people used to say? I just want to relax and watch TV and let my brain go numb. Right? That's not when the brain goes numb. That's when it gets activated. That's when the brain does this. Because the brain isn't the body. The body gets tired. The brain doesn't. The brain keeps going. Have you ever had a situation in your life that was a difficult thing and not that anyone here suffers from anxiety? Ah! <laughs> what happens when anxiety, nervousness, and worry comes into your life? You can't shut that brain off, can you? I don't care if you take Xanax. I don't take, care what you take. I don't care if you throw back a few. Let me tell you what's going to happen. That brain is on. The squirrel is loose in the cage, isn't it? I'm not making fun of you. I'm just saying that's what happens to me. And the walls start doing what? It's a horrible place to be. It really is a horrible place to be. That's why whenever it is that we shut our brain off and we think that we have shut it off, 
that's when you're in danger. And by the way, whenever your brain starts doing that and it starts wandering, where does it go? Where does the brain and the thoughts go? Okay, I'm about to go from preaching to meddling. <laughs> Let me tell you where it goes. It goes to the land of pleasure. Why? Because in this thinking war that I'm in, in all the stuff that I'm putting up with, in all the fires that I'm putting out, in all the fires that are chasing me and all the above, there is no pleasure in it. I'm that dancing chicken on the grill. I'm just trying to, trying to survive one more day. And all of a sudden, if I shut the brain off, what does the brain do? It goes to a land, it goes to a place of pleasure where all of my troubles don't exist. The only problem with that is you now start going to the war chest and the basement of your past and your life and you become Lot. In other words, I wonder what I got here. And the very things that you repented of and the very things that were destroying you and the very things, they're still there. And so you take the key, you think nobody's watching, you think nobody's around, and all of a sudden, she's going to let him out for a little bit. Just for a second. Because, boy, it's been rough out there. I'm having my lunch handed to me. Boy, I got this bill coming up. I got this, I got this horrible boss. I got this, I got that. And it's like, I just, I just need to go to Pleasureland and Dixieland for just a moment. And out he comes. And my hands do this. They become idle. And the brain is off to the races. Now, why did I say Lot? The Bible says this. It says that when Abraham and his camp grew, and so did Lot's, he said, listen, there's so much between us, and they started fighting against each other. He said, Abraham came and, said, came and said, choose an area. You go this way, I'll go this way. Because we're family. Immediately he said, he lifted up his eyes, and he looked toward Egypt, uh, toward Sodom. And he said, it reminds me like the plains of Zoar. He started thinking, boy, it looks just like Egypt. Well, if you read the Bible, one of the greatest mistakes that Abraham ever made was going to Egypt. That's where he picked up Hagar. That's where he picked up a custom that God never gave him. That's when he went to a place called Hei and, and, and Bethel. He's between, Hei, Hei means ruin, Bethel means house of God. He was right in between the middle, and he chose to go to Egypt. And he took Lot with him. He took everybody with him. So then he gets right back as Brother Dennis said a while back, the exit that he get, got off on, he went back and started going down the right path, and now he's going where God has called him. And so now they begin to prosper and to be blessed. He said, pick a side. What did he pick? He picked the plains going towards Sodom. He says, and the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked. What in the world happened? What happened is his mind went to where he thought was the greatest place of pleasure. You see, as soon as you do that, you start remembering things. And I got news for you. We have all done shameful things. And we have all been places we should have never been before. And when we come to Christ, we have shame over it. Let me tell you something an old woman told me one time. She goes, Brother Roland, our generation and your, your generation wasn't that different. And I'm like, all this time, I think the older people, it's like, no, you guys are a great... She goes, let me finish. We, we, we had uh, Blueberry Lane, just like you did. We went and did what you did. But let me tell the difference between your generation and mine. After we did it, we were ashamed of it. Your generation gets pride in it. That's the difference. You have lost the ability. Your generation's lost the ability to have shame. We were ashamed of it. You guys brag about it. That's the difference. She goes, that's, and if you notice, as the generations go, they're bragging more about the things that they're doing. I mean, I, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. So what happens in our lives is this. There are things that come into our lives to the church. Boy, let me tell you the despicable thing that I did. Boy, Brother Tim, let me tell you, I hit an all-time low when I was here. But when my mind goes idle, it wasn't that bad. 
Boy, she sure was pretty. I don't remember the consequences. I don't remember the price that was paid. I don't remember any of those things because sin is deceptive, isn't it? And it always paints a picture. Hasn't that ever happened to you? Well, maybe just to me. That whenever it is things got really, really, really bad being a Christian, all of a sudden I lose friends, all of a sudden I can't make a friend in, for my life, all of a sudden I get passed up for promotions because I am a Christian and I'm not out getting drunk with them and all of these things, and I, they're passing me by, and all of a sudden I hear that little whisper and all of a sudden it was like, boy, I didn't have this much trouble when I was, a Christ, when I was lost. Boy, I had money in my pocket, I had friends every... You see, it's deceptive because I don't remember the rest of the stuff. And the picture's not true. So David goes to a place, and when he does, it says that... So when it says this, I mean, let me be brutally honest with you, can I? The Bible says this, it says, And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed. What in the world do you think he's doing laying in bed? What do you think he's thinking about? Do you think he's thinking about slaying Goliath? You think, he's, you think he's thinking about all of the men who are in debt and distress coming to him and asking him for help? You think he was thinking of the priest of Nob or thinking of all these? David had something else on his mind. And his mind has grown idle. His hands have grown idle. And his brain is now doing this. So guess what he does? Look at it. It says, he arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. You guys ever been, ever seen where the, the city of David and how everything was constructed? Uh, what advantage do you have walking on the roof? You can see what you can't see from the ground. So what do you think he was looking for? What do you think he was doing at the hour when bathing occurs? What do you think David is doing during this time? He's a peeping Tom. It's like, literally, that's what's going on. And he starts, by the way, things, ha things are very odd. Do you know that when that sun starts going down to certain people who have dementia and Alzheimer's, you know what they experience? What's it called? Sundowners. When does that happen? Oh, in about an hour. They start fidgeting. They start doing the same thing. What happens to uh, a woman that has lost her husband of 50 years? What happens in about an hour? That same sun that goes down on the, on the land, that same darkness comes over her. And boy, she starts missing him. And all of a sudden, this sorrow comes over them. There is something about this time of the day that affects people in a lot of different ways. Well, I got to tell you something. After a long day, this is when the individuals, mainly the ladies, would take their baths. So David is strolling on top of the roof, not throughout the city to see how everybody's doing, not throughout his chambers to be able to see something else. He is strolling on, he knows exactly what he's looking for. And so as he is strolling, now how did all this happen? How did this begin? And who are we talking about? Are we talking about just some, some bum? We're talking about some guy that he, he can't find Genesis in a Bible drill? We're talking about the sweet psalmist of Israel. We are talking about the preferred king. We are talking about a man after God's own heart. What's the second thing that that tells me? The second thing it tells me is this. If it can happen to David, you better believe it can happen to me. A lot of times we go into things and we start saying to ourselves, nothing could ever happen to me. You're already praying. I'm not telling you go around and start saying, I'm looking for anything. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is we should walk around every day realizing how things are always coming against us. What does that make me do? It makes me trust God and yield to God more because I don't trust myself. God, help me. God, please help me. God, help me to stay where you want me to stay. God, help me to do. I'm developing some curriculum for you guys and and I'm developing some stuff that will be study material within groups and also within the preaching time, the teaching time, and all the above. And I was given something. When I was a sophomore in my undergraduate studies, I was given a piece of paper. The other day we were driving, and Chuck Swindoll, we were listening to him, and, he, and, I, and I, told, I looked at Shannon and said, I haven't heard that in years. Let me tell you what it is. What it is is, is a little exercise, and you're going to get the exercise. I'm going to tell you ahead of time. 
The exercise is this. Write down a letter. Let's say I have, in my life, I have my daughter Katrina, I have my son Daniel, I have Shannon, I have my sister Minga. Those are the closer people, and I have the church. So what do I do? Write a letter to my sister Minga, to Shannon, to my daughter, to my son, to my church. And it begins like this. Please forgive me for what I am about to tell you and write a letter as if though it's the day after you've committed adultery. Write it down. And then get all of the feeling of what it would feel like for me to write that letter to you, write that letter to Shannon, write that letter to my dear daughter, to my son. Throw in my grandson, Cesar. Brother, why would you do something like that? I would rather write it down and have it so appall me and have it be so hideous, it would scare the living hell out of me. I'd rather write that imagining it rather than write it because it happened. Does that make sense? David had it happen. If it can happen to David, it can happen to you. It can happen to me. Do I look for it? Was he looking for it? No. Was David wanting to be out of the will of God? No. Did David want to hurt Uriah or the kingdom or the prophet? No. Did David want for all of these hideous things? No. But here comes the disclaimer. No, 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 but he did it anyway. Well, that should just scare the living fire out of you. It scares the living fire out of me. Because I'm nowhere near the league of David. Are you kidding me? I'm more in the line of Saul. <laughs> Not David. So the Bible says David starts perusing all, and he's looking from top bottom. Where he's looking, where he just came from, and what time of the day it is. Please don't let any of those things slip your mind. The Bible says this. It says, he walked... And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Boy, just that sentence alone should be enough to go away. Because when you see that, and it says right there, it says the daughter of Eliam. Why was Bathsheba so close to David? Why was she in that proximity? It's because Eliam is the son of Ahithophel, David's principal counselor. Nobody knows more about David than Ahithophel. Ahithophel loved David. A lot of the victories David has in his kingdom is because of the counsel of Ahithophel. He starts looking at his granddaughter. He starts looking at one of his prized soldier's wife. So guess what happens? What happens is now that he has seen, it overwhelms his sense of right and wrong. Well, you better know that there is a strong connection to what you see. Uh, when, when, I, when I first became, not became a Christian, when I start, first started working, I worked in the nursery. Because I was so scared of people, but I wasn't scared of kids. And so, man, I painted the walls and I'd be... And I remember, because uh, I didn't know anything about kids, I didn't know anything about church, I'd never been in church, and so I'd listen to, to uh, tapes on children's music, and I'd memorize them, and I'd sing the songs with the kids. And the first song that I ever learned working with babies was this one. They're there, and I can see all of them in my mind. They're all grown and married now, but they were all there. They had some in their little diapers and some learning to walk, and I'd grab them in a circle like this, and I'd start moving around, and I'd start saying, I'd look at them and say, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. And they'd start going like this. And they'd start, and I'd say, be careful. What you see finds its way to your mind and your heart in lightning manner. Not days, not weeks. Lightning. Split seconds. Do you know how long it takes for you to get a porn, porn, porna, pornographic image off your mind? If you were disciplined, if you're disciplined, 10 years per image. 
10 years. Imagine somebody that's watching this stuff three to five hours a day. Those images are in your head. And you can't move. I don't care how much you call on the name of Jesus. I don't care how much you go to the altar. I don't care how much you sing praises and songs. I don't care what you do. You can't get those images out of your head now. They're there. They're there. And you have to deal with them. And they will come when you grow idle. Listen, I'm, I'm talking plain to you now. I'm not trying to be obscene or anything like that. But I have to tell you, whenever you're on a long drive or whenever you're somewhere sitting for a long period of time, guess what your favorite movie is going to be what are you going to replay in here it's going to be that stuff that's a scary thought isn't it why do you think it's so accessible to kids why do you think it's so accessible we have an enemy and while he cannot make you do things and while he cannot force you or me to do things he sure can dangle it in front of you can he as a matter of fact i love to fish i i I, I envy you hunters. I really wish I was a hunter. I really do. I just, you know, I do love the boom and I love all that, but, you know, I just, I don't get off on killing Bambi, you know. But I love to fish. I love to fish. So no, no criticism on you hunters. You just, as long as you give me meat, I'm cool. Uh, Y'all shoot whatever you want to. I have a couple of family members I'd love for you to shoot. But anyway, <laughs> they asked me the other day, do you miss me? I said, with every bullet. <laughs> But I love to fish. I love to fish. And I love to fish with live bait. I love to fish with live bait. I love catching it with the net and all the above. But I got to tell you what really turns me on when I'm fishing. It's whenever I'm able to put a lure and throw it out there and all of a sudden something snatches it. Good grief. That is just the greatest feeling in the world when the fish took my bait and I didn't have to pay for it. I didn't have to catch it. I just put it on there and boy, he, he came and got it. Do you know that sport fishing, when it started, what they did, because they used to catch them in nets. Indians would catch them in nets, and they used to do different. But when they started making it a sport, this is what they did. They caught some beautiful fish, netted them, put them on the side. Then they gutted them, opened them up. What were they doing? They were seeing what the fish loves to eat. So they might have found crabs or might have found shrimp. or what, And they're like, that's what this fish likes. It's inside his gut. So then they started making artificial things just like what was in their stuff. That's where it comes to lure. And then you would throw it out. Then you would, they would study the way the, the crab moves her, and they would imitate the thing. And here comes it. Every man is drawn away by his own lust. What a lot of people blame the devil for, all he did was imagine the devil okay just imagine that not the big old horns and that that's that's your mother-in-law that's not the devil so th imagine the devil and he's got a, a, a you know like those fishing hats that got all the lures on them imagine the devil like that and he's got his little vest and he's got his hooks and he's got his shorts his bermudas and he's got his nice little and, he, and he's out there and, and you know it's like uh, and he's got his sunglasses he's got his little ray-bans or whatever and he goes out there and he sees the fish moving, and he sees this and that, and he puts a lure. That's not working. Let me try another one. And boy, he's just having the time of his life. And then all of a sudden, boy, the bright yellow or orange, they start striking that. You know what he does? He makes note. What time is it? Well, it's about 9 o'clock in the morning. From 9 to 10, boy, they were hitting this. And guess what he knows? He knows what you like to eat at, what time you like to eat it and how to make that thing move so that you bite it. He's not making you bite it. He just knows what you like. So whenever it is that we start getting lured, all the devil does, imagine that fisherman with the hat, all he does is throw what he sees is inside you. And he just starts luring it right in front of you. That's all he does. And by the way, once again, fishing. But hunters, you may... You may express yourself. What do you do with a trophy game? In other words, let's say a uh, second largest trout in the state of Texas. You do what with it? What do you do if, what's a big deer? What's the size of an unusually big deer? Like the prize deer. But what's the prize deer? How many? 
Okay, I don't even know what that means, but okay, let's say a 34-point deer. And let's say that deer weighs 150 pounds more than a prize deer. What would you do with that thing? I mean, what would you do with a 34-point deer? And what, what would you do? You'd mount it at your cost, your expense. Would you put him in the garage in the corner where nobody can see him? You'd put him, boy, right there in the den, right? Or the living room or whatever it may be. You'd put him right there, and all of a sudden you got the mother-in-law's picture right next to it, you know, and you got her mounted there to it. <laughs> so you got this big old beautiful deer sitting there. Whenever you invite another hunter there, what do you do? How did you kill it? Where did you kill him? Is a little bit of bragging starting to occur? Would you have show pictures of when you shot him? Boy, you'd be so excited, wouldn't you? Boy, some of you right now are just going to go shoot a deer, aren't you? <laughs> what do you think the devil does with a former servant of God? What do you think he does with someone that served God, loved God, was effective for God? A 34-point Christian. I'm talking about a haymaker. I'm talking about a guy or a girl that was serving God leading people to the Lord and serving and doing. You put up a hell of a fight, but he brought you in. Do you think that he would be mounting you and saying, I caught this one. Isn't it pretty? I can't begin to tell you how many people might be in the devil's trophy case because they're no longer effective for the things of God. They are no longer effective in what God put in their heart to do. Why? They grew tired of the work. They grew tired of what God wanted from them. They didn't grow tired in it. They grew tired of it. The mind starts wandering. The heart starts racing. And all of a sudden, I think I can't be touched. All of a sudden, I start thinking nothing can ever happen to me. All of a sudden, I start thinking, listen, I am above reproach. Listen. If you think that, take heed, the Bible says, lest you fall as well. And, we ha and I'm, not, I'm not telling you you're doing anything wrong, and I'm not pointing a finger, I'm just saying, be careful. Be careful. Look at, the, look at the warning signs. If all of a sudden I'm like, I don't have to do anything for God. I've already served. Do you, know, do, you know how many, uh, do you know how many preachers are sitting at First Baptist something because they think their service is over? Our churches are, our churches are, a uh, uh, friend of mine, I, I didn't know him real well, but I would call him my friend, not too far from here, Baptist Church down the road, eight years. He was asked to leave, you got 30 days to leave. And he's sitting there, he's reeling from this, and he's, it's not like they're growing on trees. Now all of a sudden that church has no pastor. You go down the road, the other one's getting to retire, the other one doesn't want to do it anymore buildings with weeds coming up around it and all the above and we're seeing this but if you go to first baptist something there's probably around 30 preachers sitting in there that are saying i've already done my job i might grow tired but i'm not going to retire all right to get tired it's okay to get tired go do some fishing go chase the goose for a while or let the goose chase you you know have some fun listen if you need a break take a break I bet you guys had a great time just, oh, boy, I don't have to be cleaning up spills. I don't have to hear this wise guy tell me about what I'm wearing today and actually go and get away from 104. My thought is have fun. Go enjoy your family. Go and thank God. Go and praise God. Go and, and go, get your, go get your second wind. It's okay. Sometimes you need to go get your second wind because sometimes... We just keep going and going and going and going. And then we don't want to do anything in the meantime. I'm tired. I've had enough. I've had enough. Y'all can keep whatever you want. I don't want to do this for me. Be careful. Because as soon as you do, you will find yourself on the rooftop. As soon as you do, you will start looking. As soon as you do, things will come into your eyes that you cannot remove. Things will come into your heart that can't be undone. You know the story. Think of the sequence of events. How 
quickly they happen. She's now pregnant. And by the way, they didn't have they didn't have wine, they didn't have drinks and candlelight. David raped her. And all of a sudden she is pregnant. And she is married. And her husband is at war. And it's one of his prized warriors. Well, all of a sudden the devil says, well, I've done my work here. Have fun, kids. <laughs> See in the funny papers. I've had enough. My work is done. And then David does what we all do. He tries to fix it. Rather than coming to God and saying, God, I've greatly sinned. He starts to fix it. I got news for you. Every time I try to fix what I mess up, I only mess it up more. It's worse. But whenever it is I go to God and I just come clean with God, God has a way of getting things done that I could never do. He grew tired. He grew bored. David saw all the accomplishments. I'm the hero. I'm the king. I killed the giant. Women sang songs after me. Everyone wants to be me. Careful, David. Because now you're taking credit for what God did. And all of a sudden you are exalting yourself and you're diminishing God. Let me tell you an effective thing. You always know you're doing the right thing in God if you are diminishing and he is beginning to grow stronger. That's when you know it's right. If all of a sudden I'm something that I'm not, I am in great danger. And there is, uh, what do you call it, one of those laser right there, and it's like, I wonder where that laser... <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Remain steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know that your labor is not in vain. Stay in the war. Stay in the battle. I know it's, I know it's tiresome. I know sometimes it hurts. I know... So but in every one of those instances, God will only make you stronger. And God will only put Jonathans around you. And God will bless you. And God will lead you. But don't grow weary of the work. Grow weary in it. Go to South Carolina. Go to Austin. Go to the park. Go barbecue. Go do whatever. Grow tired in it. Not of it. If you grow tired of it, you are in great danger. You grow weary of it, welcome to the club. It's okay. It's all right. I want you to look at this portion of scripture. I want you to study this because I'm going to go to another place in the following weeks. We are working on, on quite a bit of stuff, and Shannon is helping me a lot, bouncing things off of her. We're starting. But um, what we have, what we've been talking about, studying all the above. My goodness, has it not been valuable? I mean, in our own lives, our own families, our own, and boy, we can, okay, we get it, God, we get it. Uh, and our families are at stake. I got to tell you something, our families are at stake. I'm not, I'm not pointing the finger, it's you. No, 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 I'm just saying, it is so dangerous that what we need to do is we need to arm ourselves properly, strengthen one another, encourage one another, do the right things for the right reasons. And if we do so, if we do so, it doesn't mean we're gonna, not going to come out scathed. It doesn't mean that we're going to just be immovable. What it means is we're not going to go into anything blind. Eyes wide open. I got a final question to ask you. Are you the type of person that likes to hear what needs to be done whispering or you like, a, like for people to tell you? I need to talk to you. No screaming, no ugly, no cursing. Just, I got to tell you, your car is going to need, or would you like somebody to skate around it and not tell you the truth? Tell me the truth. Let me deal with it. If my car's this, if my dog, listen, if my dog is 15 years old, Mr. Vet, and you're telling me that the best thing is to lay him, tell me. Don't start telling me stories. Just tell me. Well, the same thing with God. God, if there be any wicked way in, in me, just tell me. If there be something you want for me, tell me. And I believe if you approach him that way, he'll tell you. 
And it won't be to hurt you. It'll only be to strengthen you. I would ask you to continue praying. Uh, I know we have quite a few prayers. Um, um, Brother Lacer is a, he's a prince. I, I went and spent time with him, and uh, boy, he's a good guy. Uh, he's a big boy. His hands swallow up my, I mean, I'm like, dear God, I hope you never get mad at me. But so gentle. And his wife is so precious. His sister you met Sunday. Uh, he's really sick. And big old smile. Trusting God. So please pray for him. His kidneys have shut down. And they think it's because of all the medication. So he's doing dialysis. But... His, I got. She texted me just before church to let you know that his blood pressure is, they couldn't get it under control. So they had to stop what they were doing because they couldn't control it. Um, please pray for them. They are precious people. Uh, we also have individuals that have come and they have other individuals that are ill. Cancer as well. And our, our power is prayer. Our strength is prayer. But not just praying, it's doing something, right? Whatever we can do for this family and every other family, that's why we're here. Second thing I want to tell you is the lady that you led to the Lord and the one that's, I can't say their name because now they, it's a Medicare thing. I am speaking to a representative, to a politician, and the politician is after glory to get credit and applause and more votes. I don't care. And he, I think... He says there's a project called Dave, and there's another project, and so he's tapping into it, and he's also an attorney. So uh, I'm meeting not with him, but with his secretary tomorrow. So please pray for that. Uh, and we have gotten people over there to help him with the bathing, the hygiene, and help him. Uh, we got a brand new air condition installed for them, a little window unit, and uh, that was given. Somebody asked me, could you use an air condition? I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Gave it to me in a box. You're not going to believe this, Sam. You can go over and see it. It's the exact same measurement as the one that was in the, the window. It had wood on it. Remember, it has wood on it and stuff. We, uh, we, we, we hit that thing, pulled it out. We slipped it in. Perfect. Perfect. And we killed all the bees. There was a bunch still there, so killed them all. So anyway... Uh, that happened because somebody went and told them about Jesus. And there's a lot more of them out there. So please pray for that family as well. If you want to know their name, ask Sam. Uh, but uh, please pray tomorrow that this representative can help. Uh, because it's touchy, but it's a good thing for a politician. So that's what I thought. I said, a politician, he can help me. So <laughs> it, that's where you take the dastardly things of someone and turn it around for good, right? <laughs> So please pray that that turns out as well. Do you have any other prayer requests? Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll pray for the person drawing blood because in all likelihood, he's the one that's going to bless her or him. Anyone else? Continue praying for your dad. How's your dad doing? Okay. Absolutely. Your daughter is walking. She was in a bad crash. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. Thank you for that. Pray for your job. Absolutely. And for the uh, dinner you're going to buy for me. <laughs> That's been recorded, by the way. <laughs> Pray for baby. Yes, sir. In Castroville? I know the family. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, I sure do. I don't know where he lives, but I know the I know the last name. Yes, the Lord. We will. Father, we thank you for the blessings of this day, dear Lord, and for all that you do. For all that you've done, all you're doing, and all you're going to do. Help us not to get stuck in what you've done, but let us see also what you're doing and what you're going to do. And dear God, that we would continue engaging in what you would have us to engage in and continue to pursue what you would have us to pursue. I thank you for each family, each home that is represented here this evening. I thank you for the baby, dear Lord. I ask you just continue to bless the child, dear Lord, mama, and, and continue to do as you have done until now. I do ask you, Brother Lassier, dear Father, I ask you for him this evening. He knows we're praying for him, and he knows we're praying for him even at this hour. Continue to strengthen him, dear God. Continue to speak to his life. Use him as a witness as you have there with all the nurses and doctors that they may see something different in him. And dear God, we do thank you for the wonderful report. Thank you so much uh, after the wreck that she is. Well, thank you for that. We praise you, dear God. And Father, for uh, Brother Tim doing so well, Father, that the report would only continue and that he would be blessed. And Father, we ask you as well for unspoken requests. There are many in our lives tonight. Thank you for the job that you've provided for precious, dear God. Father, let it be a blessing that will lead to more blessings, dear God. And so, Father, we thank you, we praise you. We ask you bless the booth, dear God, where they are as well as they are enjoying their time. Bless them, dear God, that they might continue to enjoy themselves. And, Father, we thank you for all the many blessings. And, Father, bless our time. We love you, we thank you for all these things. And we thank you, dear Lord. And we thank you in the blessed and holy name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. God bless you. All right.